Hello everyone, you're all very welcome to the latest Evidence Dialogues Conversations with. I'm Yvonne mcdermott Reese. I'm a professor of law at Swansea University in the UK and I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor William Tyning. Uh, William, as many of you will know, is the Emeritus uh, Quain Professor of Jurisprudence at UCL and he's written over a 60-year career, he's written on a broad range of uh, subjects and disciplines um, but specifically focused in four areas really, so jurisprudence, legal education, um, globalize <clears throat> globalization and the law and evidence, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and he's also, I think it's fair to say that the forefather of this um, evidence dialogues project that is an interdisciplinary collaboration that seeks to examine evidence um, and discuss issues of evidence from a range of different contexts, disciplines and areas of practice. So thank you, William, you're very welcome. Thank you, Yvonne. And thank you, everybody who's listening. <laughs> So William, tell us a little bit about your, your background. How did you get into the study of evidence? It's a somewhat strange story. I was, for most of the start of my career, mainly a jurist and intellectual historian, mainly interested in jurisprudence in a fairly conventional way. Um, and then I applied for a job at the University of Warwick in 1972. And I knew that at my interview, I would be asked, what subject are you going to Warwickize? Now, Warwick was committed to the idea of broadening the study of law from within. So the law school would be involved with law as a discipline, but the stimulation for all this was dissatisfaction with the rather narrow conceptions of academic law that pervaded at the time. So every candidate for a post, however junior or senior, was asked, well, what subject are you going to take up and broaden in the Warwick way? I had decided before my interview that I would look for something that I didn't know much about and that I would come fresh to without too many prejudices and biases. So my first choice was land. But unfortunately, land had been occupied <laughs> by Patrick McCausland, who did a great job with it. And so my second choice was evidence, on which I'd never had a course, but I was familiar with Jeremy Bentham's writings on evidence. So that's how I started. And for the next 20 years, this was my main academic project. And I'm a bit of an intellectual historian, so the first, when I start on a new project, the first question I ask is, done before? And to my amazement, this it was a huge history, which as far as legal writing in the 20th century was concerned, had really been touched on at all. Went back to classical times. I found my daughter doing her O-levels, as they were then called, had as one of her texts, a thing that I used later um, in, in teaching, the murder of Herodes. And um, I then found that you know, Aristotle, Aristotle's logic, Aristotle's rhetoric, then through medieval times, particularly rhetoric and logic, and then up to the 19th century, when evidence really became a subject of attention quite late in law. And the first treatise on the subject was by Chief Baron Gilbert, who had been exiled to Dublin. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and he set up a study of evidence in terms of a hierarchy of strength of types of evidence. Official documents under the seal at the top, down to official documents un not under seal, to official to unofficial documents under seal, down to witnesses as the very bottom. That's rather like what happened in the early days of evidence-based medicine. Mm. This provided a target for Jeremy Bentham, 
really launched the theoretical study of evidence in England, um, and he destroyed Gilbert's hierarchy of evaluation of evidence, which is still around in evidence-based approaches, for instance, to all sorts of things. Through the 19th century, scholarship in England developed with some interest in the United States, but it wasn't really until about 1900 that the Americans really started to focus. And then they took over. And the main figures start around 1900. A man called ja James Bradley Thayer at Harvard, who taught John Henry Wigmore, who became the dominant figure in the United States, and in fact, the common law world, um, for the next 40 years. And it's amazing how dominant he was until he died in 1943. Wigmore divided the subject of evidence in law into two parts. The law of evidence, the rules really concerning with the admissibility and exclusion of evidence from trials, and the principles of judicial proof as found in logic, psychology, and general experience. Three very interesting words in this context. Wigmore's treatise on the law of evidence was revered and was hardly challenged until just about the time of his death. Wigmore's principles, on the other hand, was dismissed as a dilettante's flirtation with all sorts of strange things like, like uh, <coughs> lie detectors and um, other bits of things that were just beginning to de develop in forensic science and in various other related disciplines to which Wigmore contributed, but is largely unsung and is now unreadable because he's totally out of date. But he did really start to pioneer those and hasn't really been credited with enough with that. Principles of judicial proof, however, survives in terms of the logic of argumentation. Um, and that he was just laughed off the scene by the, his legal audiences. Mm -hmm. And he persisted and felt that, in fact, the principles were foundational to the law and bitterly regretted that this hadn't been recognized, infiltrated some of it into his books on the law of evidence. But it didn't happen and he was ignored until three of us in the 1970s um, took him up and rediscovered him. And there were three very different people. Terry Anderson is an American defense lawyer, is also an academic, but uh, always proceeds as if he's a defense lawyer, a fairly aggressive confrontational one. David Shum, who started as a psychologist and statistician, and discovered Wigmore almost by chance in the University of Rice University, which doesn't have a law faculty. And myself, who started because of my moving to Warwick. We three quite independently started to use this in different ways. Anderson, myself, teaching law students, Sham teaching engineers, computer scientists, and not law students to start with, but perhaps most interestingly, intelligence analysts in the CIA. Um, that doesn't brand him with any political things. Eventually we got together and Anderson and I co-taught courses in, in America and produced a book in 1991 and then we still continued, and by then we got to know each other, all three of us got together. And then a long time later, in 2005, if I remember right, we produced the second edition of Analysis with Sham coming in and changing the second edition quite a lot. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a two fairly, I wouldn't say orthodox, but fairly mainstream academic lawyers, different kinds, and then someone who's completely different, um, a psychologist, statistician, he's now, re before he died, he became a specialist in information, in informatics, he was professor of in informatics in an engineering faculty, um, and had produced a lot for intellig intelligence analysis, which actually is very interesting in terms of our approach. Um, then things have developed since then in a number of directions. In the 1970s, there were debates initially in the United States, but they spread to England and into other common law countries about what were called the probability debates. And there was a schism, if you like, between two almost schools, the Pascalians or statistically oriented, who thought that various forms of statistical probability theory could apply in law, and the skeptics about this, who essentially derived the main idea in the Baconian tradition, um, of which Sham, although he was a statistician, um, became the last leader. And then in 1994, Anderson and I were in the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies, which is a think tank, studying Dutch criminal procedure. And um, we, Sham published a book, which is really the start of the movement of which our project is just a modest emanation. We used to tease Dave because he called his book The Evidential Foundations of Probabilistic Reasoning. And most of his books have titles which would make Hollywood mad with excitement. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but this was really the foundation of what we're trying to do today. In that, Sham analyzed evidential reasoning on the line of probabilities, but both mathematical and non-mathematical probabilities across six or seven disciplines, including history, including logic, including the philosophy of science and so on. Um, and we did in the Netherlands produce a book with Sham really as the starting point, mm -hmm. um, really of two lawyers and about, about nine or 10 historians but historians of very different kinds. Mm -hmm. And that was very illuminating for us. And we did produce an edited volume on that. But like a lot of books on history, it was very particularistic. And so it didn't really produce an overview or middle order kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then we continued and by chance, just at the turn of the millennium, the in England, the Leverhulme Hume Foundation and the Economic and Social Research Council, which is the publicly funded body, offered a, I look on as a prize, I'm not used to grants, but a <laughs> competition. All your thanks. <laughs> <laughs> competition for a, a grant of a million pounds. Well, in the culture of academic law, you know, even 10,000 pounds yeah. is considered a lot. And um, I, as a legal theorist, I've always done better without having grants and just got on done my own thing. But some of us bid for this and rather to our surprise, succeeded. And this is what's called evidence one, the UCL, project, it invited, it attracted people from 20 different departments, not many from the hard sciences, which was disappearing, disappointing, not many, none from astronomy, which I think is probably one of the more interesting 
disciplines on the outliers, but just going through a wonderful phase in its history at the moment. Um, and so we got together, and so some of the people weren't interested in anything other than the mother money, mm -hmm. but we did form an evidence community who interacted with each other over four or five years, rather loose membership, all sorts of odd kind of relationships de developed. Um, and in some ways, it was a bit disappointing because a question, serious question arose about what the project was about. And it was really a, a question between cognitivists and people who believe in evidence as something that can be taken seriously, and non-cognitivists, but mainly um, well, a, a range of skeptics who were attracted sometimes to rather extreme forms of postmodernism. And so I don't think postmodernists have a concept of evidence. And so in our current project, um, we recognize that there are all sorts of brands of skepticism, which are perfectly viable things, but uh, we just postulate that actually studying inferential reasoning is our central concern, and that requires some philosophical foundations which fit into the cognitivist, inductivist tradition. So just picking up on that idea of um, uh, inferential reasoning being at the heart of what this is all about and, and sort of moving away from this idea that, well, there is no truth, only perspectives. It's, you know, that the, there is something there that we can focus in on. Um, I was interested in something that you haven't mentioned, another interdisciplinary collaboration, which is your work with Rene Wise, um, a Shakespearean scholar, and uh, both of you analyzed the Bywater, Bywaters and Thompson case, um, you from a jurist perspective and Rene Wise from the perspective of a Shakespearean scholar. So um, do you want to tell us a wee bit about that? And I guess, what did you learn from that in terms of um, different standpoints and how different disciplines reason about evidence and draw inference from ev evidence? Well, this was a, chance thing. I, there's a famous case in the 20, 1922, which many of you will be familiar with because it's one of the most celebrated and discussed co in English trial history, really, um, in which Edith Thompson, the manageress of a fashion shop, was accused of inciting her lover, Freddie Bywaters, who was eight years younger than him and was a ship's clerk, um, to kill Percy Thompson. And Bywaters indeed did get convicted, and nobody really doubts that, of murdering Percy Thompson. So the interest in the case was on Edith's involvement and responsibility for this. And it's got a huge literature. There was a rather good feminist novel by F. Tennyson Jesse, um, A Pin to See the Peep Show, which became a movie, but there have been other rather less good movies. Um, and there's a huge literature. I had been using it in teaching for quite a long time. And so I was very intimately familiar with the case, but had concentrated mainly on the trial record. Quite independently, we didn't even know, even know each other or know each other's existence. Rene Weiss in the English department in UCL, so in the same institution, had almost secretly been writing a book about the innocence of Edith Thompson. He's secretly because he didn't think his colleagues would think this was serious scholarship for a Shakespeare scholar. And so he kept it rather quiet but he had become passionately involved in debates about capital punishment and had then become passionately involved in 
the innocence of Edith Thompson, believing very strongly that she was wrongly convicted. We learned of each other when we had both completed a text. I had been giving a fairly lighthearted lecture on analyzing love letters as evidence, um, which is quite, quite a good thing on the lecture circuit. Mm. But um, I had done quite serious analysis of the case for teaching purposes. We discovered that each of us had done this quite independently and that we had each adopted very different approaches to the question. And there is all sorts of subtle questions, things about what exactly the question is. But let us say that do we in 2022 think that Edith was rightly convicted of murder on the basis of the evidence presented to the court? Now, there was other evidence, and some of it was not insignificant, but all the focus of attention on the interest of the case has been on Edith's love letters. Mm -hmm. One of my students said, if you can analyze Edith's prose, you can analyze anything. And that was one of the reasons why I used it in teaching. Another was because students got intrigued in, in the case and all the psychological dimensions of it. I had use this as a way of, as a vehicle for teaching with more in analysis. Because if you could analyze Edith's prose, you could analyze Edith's guilt in Wigmorean terms. And I had concentrated on the trial record. Rennie Weiss, as well as being a Shakespeare scholar, is a social historian of some note. And he reconstructed Edith's life, including a day-by-day -day reconstruction of her relationship with Freddie Bywaters, her lover, um, and then set each love letter, of who calls, who says these are love letters, said one commentator when we were analyzing this in the law class, um, so that you could see the intimate context of each letter. And I must say, I had assumed until I came across Weiss that this was a fairly straightforward of passionate love. But in fact, Weiss has shown very convincingly that it was very up and down. And towards the end, Edith thought she was losing Freddie. And I'm convinced that he's got the story basically right. But he put her in a upwardly mobile, lower middle class position, very unusual in her time in that she was earning more than her husband and was bored stiff with her marriage. Um, and Weiss showed very convincingly that you could use all this contextual background, the novels, romantic novels that Edith was reading, the newspapers of the day, and so on, to help interpret the letters. Mm. And so you got the aff affect of each letter set, drawn out from the context as well as the prose, the unanalyzable prose. So we decided to do a joint piece, which is, I shall post on the website, well, link to it um, in due course. But this is really quite a heavy scholarly piece. So it's about 50, 60 pages long. So I'm at the moment actually trying to do a much simpler one to use examples from this rather sexy case to illustrate a number of points about Wigmorean analysis and evidence in, in general. That's really interesting. Um, I was really struck by something you said there about how Rene, in his analysis of the letters, um, looked at other things like what Edith by Waters was, was or Edith Thompson was reading, um, yeah, newspapers of the day, and it made me think a bit about some exercises in Wigmorian analysis that I've done where I've looked at international criminal judgments 
And there you, you really have to limit yourself to um, the judgment itself, the evidence that the trial chamber refers to. You can't really get into things about witness credibility and stuff like this because you weren't there, you haven't seen this person testify. Um, so I just wondered, did you have any reflections on, on that? Like, where do we where do we stop when we seek to map out a real life case um, in terms of the information we use and the, I guess, the standpoint that we start from? Well, basically, before you start on any analysis, whether with Moran or other, you have to answer the question, who are we? Or yeah. more specifically, who am I? What's my standpoint? Yeah. in this analysis and one of the big distinctions there because there's a lot to be said about that is am i trying to construct the strongest argument i can think to answer my question or am i trying to reconstruct for instance the argument in the judgment or the argument made by counsel on both sides in a case um and these can be very different mm. so if you go back to bible and thompson um, F. Tennyson Jesse was an early feminist writer, and she is clearly writing from a feminist point of view, and she rather assumes rather than analyzes whether Edith was guilty or not. She rather assumes she, she was innocent, and um, it's a it's a marvelous novel. Mm -hmm. It's totally different from. The Wigmorian case. And I think you and I may differ a little bit on the emphasis we put on trials. Mm. I think that Wigmorian analysis can apply to all sorts of activities in law and every stage in a criminal case, but it can also apply outside. Mm. So if you take intelligence analysis, you could have the standpoint of someone trying to train intelligence analysts in a useful technique, which is what Shum was doing. Or you can do a sort of ex post facto thing on whether the intelligence community or the involved agencies got it right. So in 9-11, the general verdict is that the intelligence agencies missed all sorts of tricks. 9-11 yeah. needn't happen. Well, it's a big debate, but you could use Wigmorian analysis um, having, again, to limit your the range of information you use, depending on what your purpose is. Well, in the thing with René Weiss, um, we did manage to agree on a shared question. And it was really about our own beliefs rather than the belief of the jury or the prejudices of the judge or the arguments of counsel. We used, we drew on all those, um, but we were trying to answer a shared question. And so that was why it's particularly interesting because we used such different approaches. My view is that the approaches aren't incompatible. And the one place where I disagreed well, two places, I suppose, I disagreed with Weiss. He tried to build up a case that Edith was innocent because she lived in a dream world and never committed any acts of incitement. Well, it seems to me some of the letters are clearly contain mm. criminal acts of incitement. And so if you wanted to, if you have doubts about Edith's guilt, it's not going to be the state of her mind. Mm. Um, and so I had concluded independently of Weiss that actually it was just that the letters were about nearly all the letters were about six months before the event. And there were a couple of late letters, but there wasn't any evidence of continuing incitement or continuing conspiracy, um, except for one last letter, which was very ambiguous. And so beyond reasonable doubt, or however you phrase, but which was the standard in England at that time, um, suggests that there were, that we can have reasonable doubts about Edith's thing, but I don't have any doubt that she committed acts of incitement. Mm. 
Mm. Um, that she that doesn't mean she commits, she was responsible for her husband's murder. It's interesting. Um, this all relates, I guess, to a broader debate about fact finding and the atomistic versus holistic approaches and things like this. Um, I was actually speaking to a judge, an international judge earlier, who's who's from a, a civil law background, and he said, you know, in my legal system at appellate level, um, an atomistic approach would be seen as an error of law. Um, that to to rigorously, you know, um, base each piece of evidence to a level of scrutiny that's equivalent to beyond reasonable doubt, it, it's just an error of law. And so he just sees this atomistic approach as just completely wrong. Um, I wonder if you have any any thoughts on that. <laughs> Big topic. Yeah. And since about the 1980s, there has been a lot of interest in and um, reliance on ideas about narrative in the context of jury decision making, particularly, but you can do it obviously in advocacy, narrative plays an important role. Whether it's a legitimate role is another question. And I think that a narrative analysis and account, because narratives do contain some analysis, um, does add something to justifying one's beliefs. But I also wrote quite a lot in the, my early days when I was a bit less, I thought narrative was just a sort of fashionable, <coughs> sentimental kind of approach I've come around to, to thinking it's it's much more um, it's much more important but nevertheless if you believe in infinite inferential reasoning from evidence every significant element in a narrative needs to be supported by evidence to justify a finding of fact. Yeah. And so you have evidentiary supports for everything. Otherwise, you confabulate. Yeah. So you're told the clock struck 12 and the shoe was left on the steps. And you immediately imagine a young girl in a bull dress jumping into a golden carriage with a fairy godmother helping her. But psychologists who actually develop the narrative thing yeah. say that confabulation is a very powerful element in people making conclusions about um, what happened. Mm. Well, it's a wonderful way of cheating. <laughs> and so although it performs useful functions. We have to have a couple of hours on this to mm -hmm. go into it. Um, it's also it's necessary but dangerous, is what I, the way I've put it. And it doesn't invalidate careful analytical inferential uh, argument of inferential reasoning. So your judge is wrong. <laughs> we might need to get you both in a room together to argue this one out. <laughs> Great, so I'm just going to um, wrap up this fascinating uh, discussion with a, a bit of a, a conversation on, well, a bit of a dialogue on evidence dialogue. So your latest venture of which I'm delighted to be a part. Um, so evidence dialogues, as I mentioned at the start, aims to develop a sort of a multidisciplinary field of evidence by providing a forum for the interdisciplinary exchange of ideas and discussion in relation to evidence in, in different contexts, disciplines and areas of practice. Um, so I guess without pre presaging the results of this very fun endeavor, um, what, what commonalities do you think we can find from different disciplines on how people reason about and draw inferences from evidence? Um, um, I, I guess what, what would you see as, I know actually I'll, I'll ask at the end about what we see as the ultimate goal of the project. 
I think there will be people involved in the project who want to simplify and have workable ways of dealing with very complex things. The normal selling point for Wigmore is it's a technique for managing complex facts. On the whole, you don't need to use anything as elaborate as that for this idea. So you're starting with complex fact collections and so on. And so some people want to take Wigmore and possibly Bayes networks and so on and further simplify them in order to make them immediately use, usable for non-experts. That's perfectly legitimate um, aim, and it's one of the things that Wigmore is and can be used for. My tendency is in the opposite direction, which is to complexify. And I use Wigmore in analysis to some extent to say there's a never-ending quest for trying to understand an event or circumstances or phenomena, and that Wigmore can be used for that too. So if you go to the Bywaters and Thompson kind of thing, there's never going to be a complete analysis. There's never going to be a definitive answer. Um, there'll be better and poorer arguments for particular hypotheses, depending on your standpoint. Um, but you can always go on complexifying. Um, and I can use by Western Robson for, for that purpose. So we meet in a sort of soggy middle. <laughs> and um, all of us want to simplify and complexify or complexify and simplify. Um, but it makes a big difference what your main aim is. Mm. And so I don't think there's anything in a project which requires you to have a tendency to do one or the other. And in the end, we come together, but <coughs> um, there isn't a consensus. Uh, there are a lot of contested issues within that soggy middle. Um, I think that one of the places where the project might make a contribution is at the interface between hard disciplines and soft disciplines and between reflective disciplines, ones that have really had to worry about problems of evidence as such, mm. such as history, such as philosophy of science, such as law, such as psychology, mm -hmm. and others where it's been enough, they think, to assume some kind of vision of scientific method or of problem solving or something like that, and just use fairly commonplace assumptions. Um, and I think there may be quite a few disciplines, if you start with astronomy and go on to zoology or go back <laughs> further each side of that in the alphabet, um, where people haven't thought about it. Mm. And they might learn from other disciplines. And again, it could be neighboring disciplines. So we have a forensic science stream starting in which different kinds of forensic scientists could learn from each other. That would be perfectly within what we're trying to do. But I also like playing with the jokey idea of a dating agency, yeah. that, that you get together, sometimes just one-to-one -one or small groups of people who haven't had dialogues with each other, haven't communicated with each other at all. And some of them may be people who are just making rather simplistic assumptions about evidence, whereas others have all sorts of sophisticated vocabulary and so on. Mm. I'm on the side of people who are skeptical about a grand, th grand supervening theory of evidence in general. Um, I think it's going to be much more complicated than that. Um, and then on the side of people who are very open-minded about this, you know, that they have been making working assumptions which worked reasonably well or didn't work so well or they haven't thought about. Um, beyond that, to anticipate your last question, 
I think we are just contributing to a movement that's been going on for some time. I've been involved in four projects trying to do this. It's a never ending process. If this succeeds, it will contribute something to the general movement of having a clearer idea about what evidence is a recognized field of endeavor or focus um, might be. Yeah. I think it takes us very nicely to actually where we started, where you talked about evidence one at UCL and how one of the big outcomes of that was a community, actually, of people who are interested about these questions from different disciplines. Um, so I guess this might be a good time for me to end on a, a shameless plug <laughs> for the Evidence Dialogues project and our website, which is evidencedialogues.wordpress.com. Um, on there, you can find lots of different interesting uh, things that we've put together, resources, but also um, some ideas for how people who are watching this might like to get involved. So please get in touch with us, join the mailing list. If you have an idea for one of these conversations that you'd like to uh, host, then please do let us know. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for watching and a special thanks to you, William, for this fantastic discussion. Thank you.